Everyone joining us virtually, thank you very much for your patience. We're having a, um, a tiny bit of technical issues and we'll get started in probably the next two minutes. So thank you so much for your patience. Let's see if I can please send this to you. This recent All right. Uh, good evening, everyone. Apologies for the technical difficulty. Uh, that was mine. My computer decided to restart and update at 525. So I, I don't know what happened there, but I apologize. And we are all here looking forward to another great meeting. Uh, thank you for being here. As always, you could be anywhere else, and but you're here working and serving the community uh, this evening in our virtual room. I believe that we have Councilman Chris Herndon, Councilwoman Candice Edabaka, and Councilwoman uh, Robin Kanich uh, with us. And so just want to say thank you for being here. Thank you for joining us uh, tonight. Uh, have a pretty um important agenda and so what we'll be doing tonight um is we'll be going over the the process and reviewing um our community uh the community um community conversation uh, we'll be hearing uh some brief uh, we'll get a, a brief uh update and some information on the community benefits agreement from from james roy as we discussed last time that is in its infancy and just starting. And so excited to be able to have um, some information and an update on where they are at this point in the process. And I imagine there may be additional questions. Um, and I know that James will answer those and be willing to come back and answer questions as they continue to do that work. Um, we'll kind of have a, we'll have a feedback and summary discussion uh, about the last event. 
and um, I think it's and uh, and then we will go into public comment, and uh, and then we'll we'll wrap up. Um, this 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 month we are doing the hybrid model again, and so we have new microphones this this month, and so definitely. Let us know if you can hear us. We hope that the microphones are an improvement so far. It seems like they are working well, um, but we'll definitely be looking for your feedback and apologize in advance if there's some feedback on the microphones. And so with that being said, uh, we are going to get started and um, turn it over to Courtney. We have the hybrid. Oh, yep. oh yes. yes. Sorry, I, I almost forgot. Just a couple of things. Remember um, that uh, because we are hybrid, uh, the, the, you know, this is this is a meeting of the steering committee, and so um, we have steering committee members in the room. Uh, we have steering committees who are virtual, and um, so I'll, we'll we'll be making sure that we are monitoring the screen to make sure we get all of your comments. Um, the meeting is open to members of the public to observe virtually via Zoom. Um, committee members who are attending virtually, remember that um, we need you to verbalize your thoughts and comments uh, because those who are in person can't see the chat. So we want to make sure that when we have you come off mute and share what, uh, what it is you have to share. Uh, staff are also attending virtually and in person. If there's a technology issue offsite, staff who are on online virtually will continue the meeting. And so thank you to the staff who have uh, signed up to be the designated survivor uh, of the virtual realm this month. So thank you so much. And, um, and as always, this meeting will be recorded and published on the CP, CPD YouTube channel uh, after the meeting. Uh, with that being said, we will jump into our agenda. And again, thank you all for being here and thank you for once again, uh, participating with us as we try this hybrid model uh, to accommodate everyone. Uh, thank you. So this is an overview of the schedule for the area plan. Uh, we're getting ready to release the public review draft in a few weeks, as you can see from the we are here arrow. Um, all the feedback, like the second community navigators report, all online comments, et cetera, will be made available on the project webpage at the same time with the um, public review draft plan. After the community review and comments are incorporated into the draft plan, it'll go before planning board um, sometime in, you know, around October uh, for review and approval. So if it's approved by a planning board in October, then it would follow the typical legislative cadence, culminating in a public hearing uh, at city council before the end of the year. And as uh, we talked about last month in June, the small area plan is just one part of the larger package where things like a development agreement between the property owner and the city, um, which implements some of the plan's recommendations um, are involved um, in the development agreement. Things like parkland donation to the city can be memorialized. Um, you know, and then also we have rezonings as another way to implement the plan. Um, that's articulated in the small area plan, um, you know, those built form uh, and land use recommendations. Another aspect that supports the plan recommendations is a community benefits agreement, uh, which is not led by the city, but by the community. Um, all of these steps uh, are approved. Then, you know, the conservation easement is still on the property and there would need to be a citywide vote to fully or partially release the conservation easement on the property. So that's where the small area plan fits into the uh, larger landscape. Um, we have James Roy here tonight uh, because he's playing two roles. Uh, one, Denver Metro Community Impact uh, Administer the Community Navigators, and he'll discuss um, their engagement um, over the past six months uh, and what they've heard from those in the community voices that we typically wouldn't hear from uh, in the process. Um, and second, James is here uh, in more of a private capacity leading the CBA, the Community Benefits Agreement, um, you know, which the navigators are also helping to inform. So with that, I can hand it over to James if you want to 
come up and, and grab that microphone. There's one by Kenneth, yeah. Oh, that's cool. There we go. Oh, look at that. Um, is, is right here okay? Can I, can I sit here? I feel like I'm echoing a bit. All right. So the uh, community benefits agreement. Um, you know, first I wanted to just kind of have this slide that just defines what it is. Uh, it's a contract between the community and the developer. Uh, that really, uh, of course, outlines what uh, benefits should be provided to the community. And so I've got uh, a resource that's on the slide there. It's a uh, QR code that goes to the CBA toolkit, which is a really helpful resource that we've been utilizing to uh, learn about CBAs and also what the actions are and what we need to do to uh, execute one. Go to the next slide, please. Uh, so this slide, I really want to talk about uh, why, why DMCI for the CBA. So in uh, October 2021, we were approached by a group of self-organized uh, community members that uh, really wanted to put the community's voice to action. What we uh, discovered in the community voice report to make sure that it was delivered uh, to the community and a CBA uh, it was one of those ideas that kept bubbling up in the community and, and something that uh, we've decided to embark on as a facilitator within that process. Um, we are a collective impact backbone organization that is set up to uh, facilitate this type of project. Um, and we conducted the community engagement. So the community voice report that we uh, produced in two different phases was done by us, of course. So there's some background knowledge going into the CBA that helps out with that, of course. And lastly, um, the same thing that uh, of the kind of reinforcing that again, our, our, we uh, have what's called a community impact workflow that we designed and it starts with community voice and goes into collective impact or collective action what we label as uh, community action, which is bringing together the partners and community members that uh, are asking for change through their voice and making it happen collaboratively. Uh, so next slide. Um, so what's informing the CBA? I think this is a really important piece of things here that really kind of goes into the values that we are defining uh, as a group racial equity uh, being a, a big component, of course. Uh, the community voice report, like we talked about, uh, there's three main areas that that informs. The uh, affordable housing was a major discussion point, small business opportunities and inclusive public spaces and parks. And we will also be using data from the uh, survey to inform the group. Next slide, please. Uh, so who is in the CBA? Right now there's 12 members, two of them. Actually, I think we have three from the steering committee. And uh, we're currently recruiting some small business owners for some greater uh, depth and understanding of what small business uh, needs would be, especially for small and minority owned businesses. Next slide, please. Uh, what has happened so far? So, in uh, we uh, DMCI received a grant from Rose Community Foundation for fifty thousand dollars back in twenty twenty one. Started meeting in February biweekly, and uh, so been meeting pretty frequently. There's a lot of learning to do in those uh, initial stages there. So we've essentially been learning about a CBA, reviewing the community voice report and starting to decide how things will, will uh, go moving forward. Uh, right now, we're working towards defining the values and goals of the CBA. And we've had an initial conversation with Westside Investments that uh, happened on June 20th. And then we also are drafting an NDA, a non-disclosure agreement, for the purpose of, of uh, making sure that our negotiations are successful and impactful. Next slide, please. 
the uh, goal and timeline. So we want to execute a, a impactful CBA that, of course, holds the developer accountable for building an equitable future for the community. We're helping to. And uh, we're aiming to have the uh, CBA signed by the end of the year. There's one thing I skipped over on one of the slides, the community voice report. There was a QR code uh, on the what informs the CBA. We just published this newest version. It looks like we've got some words that are kind of covering the top there. But if you go to that link at the bottom, dmcimpact.org slash PHGC, you'll see the newest version of the uh, community voice report that uh, we actually published today. So give that a look. The uh, best way to view that is on a laptop and we're on a computer, I should say. You can also view it on a, on a smartphone, but some of the more interactive elements and maps that are in there don't work as well on your cell phone. So check it out when you get a chance. That's it for me. I'll take some questions. Hey, Lisa. Uh, yes, we do. And I think we've got, I think we've got two, but um, our uh, community voice report was the, uh, the second phase of, of uh, our uh, work on that. Half of the meetings were held in Spanish. I think uh, Anna said that too. Yep. Yep, and they have been encouraged to be too. Yep, thanks, Lisa. And here the questions. And, and then, you have one more question? No. Okay, so let's go. We'll go to Patty on, on online. Yes, I was just wondering how did you pick those 12 people that are part of this agreement? I didn't pick them. They actually. Or who picked software. them? What was the process? I guess. Say that again. Uh, I guess I'm more interested in whether the process was, and you know, the 12 community members that will be on the agreement, the CBA. Yeah. So those 12 initial members were self-organized, and we're recruiting for additional perspectives right now. Okay. So they're the ones that came together to form this agreement. Is that what you're saying? Yes. So I really appreciate the intent behind all of this. Um, are there other examples of CBAs in Denver or Colorado that have been enforced or like what's the process of that aside from the development and adoption of a CBA? Yeah, there are um, other CBAs that have been enforced in Denver. Uh, through city council, there's one that was done at the uh, Gates site on uh, I-25 and Broadway. Um, and I believe I'm forgetting the name of the other one that we've been looking at, but actually uh, this week during our CBA coalition meeting, we reviewed uh, five other CBA examples around the country to find best practices and see what, uh, what's been working well and what hasn't. And I just got a message from my uh, from my a coworker that said the GES um, CBA is the other one that we're looking at. Any other questions for anyone here? Any other questions from virtual members? I just have more question. I just I'm wondering if there's any representation, you know, in the Hispanic community and this community members are part of the CBA. Yes. Okay. Will we be able to know who the members are eventually? Yes. How soon will that take place? How soon will you know the uh, members of the coalition? Yes. Um, Probably, you know, I don't know the answer to that yet. Okay. 
Rachel. Is uh, the NDA standard practice? That's what I've heard. Yep. And can you say more about the intent? Uh, I know you said so that you can achieve the goals and be able to negotiate. Um, is there more you can say about why? Yeah. So what my understanding is, is that uh, because we'll be doing some legal negotiations between uh, the group and Westside, that uh, some of the things that uh, will be negotiated uh, need to happen in a, in a way that uh, doesn't complicate things by spreading around as rumors are in the community. Why has that process been kept such a secret, particularly from this committee? I would think that this committee um, should have been privy to that information a long time ago. We had to hear from outside sources that there even was um, um, a CBA being formed. And so I just don't think that's very transparent. And I don't know why it's such a secret. Yeah, well, we're telling about it now. But one of the things I'd say with the, uh, the elements of that is uh, fear. There's a lot of fear within the group of retaliation and, uh, and just the drama, general drama that happens in this process. That tends to generate drama when yep, you're not sure it, it does. But uh, one of the things that we're trying to do is, of course, build a strategic process that uh, will be very transparent and uh, it's going to get there. But uh, right now, we're just facilitating a process of self organized folks that have come together to put the CBA together. So the process that is being done right now is under the NDA, but then there will be an open process to engage the broader community under the CBA that is going to be more inclusive so that there's information being shared both ways. I just would like to. Yeah, so the CBA is informed, like I said, by uh, engagement work that has already been done and been reported to this group. Um, with the, uh, and that is what these members are working under the intention of, is to make sure that uh, the, what the community has expressed and desired from a benefits standpoint is achieved. Um, the other thing that I'd say, okay, I just lost my train of thought. Completely lost my train of thought. I was going to say one other thing. Any other questions? Come back to you. <laughs> yeah. Who, who specifically is doing the recruiting? Uh, we are. DMCI. Who's DMCI? It's a nonprofit. What does it stand for? <laughs> well, I mean, it stands for Denver Metro Community Impact. I don't like you. All right, do we have any other questions in the virtual environment? Looking for hands now. Let's see, uh, any, any other questions here in the room? Okay. Right. Seeing no further questions, uh, thanks. Thank you so much for being here. Cool, thanks. So now we're going to transition into um, oh, so now we're going to transition into uh, a conversation to get oh, on our on the on feedback uh, the feedback summary of what uh, we learned at the last community meeting and then open that up to steering committee members really want to hear from you uh, what did you think what did you see um, what did you hear from your guests or folks that you had an opportunity to talk to. Uh, when you were here. Thank you, Dr. Roz.
So uh, since the beginning, the community's input has informed the process in multiple ways through workshops and open houses like the ones that we just had on June 30th, uh, also through this group, the steering committee, the community navigators, uh, community survey, and online comments. At the most recent open house for the draft recommendations, we had uh, 124 attendees in person, 95 of those who chose to fill out the optional demographic survey. Half of the people filled out that survey selected uh, that they lived in the Park Hill neighborhood. Um, we had Northeast Park Hill, South Park Hill, North Park Hill. They did write in their own, it was Park Hill. Um, while 22% uh, selected other neighborhood not listed from the, the list right there. Um, the majority who completed the demographics uh, survey owned their home, and 35% uh, of those people were between the ages of 65 and 74 years old. 51% uh, of those who chose to complete that uh, demographic survey uh, that attended the open house were white. 34% uh, identified as Black or African American. Um, so these demographics aren't unique to this process. Uh, this is why we have input from the community navigators and other avenues like the community survey to make sure that we are having diverse voices representative and representative of those um, that we see in, in the area. So in terms of feedback um, related to housing recommendations, we heard a desire for more details around who the affordable housing will be available to how long it will be affordable for, the number of affordable units, the prioritization of for sale housing for those missing middle incomes, which are generally those households that make um, between 70 and 120% of AMI, which would be um, for a two person household for 120% AMI, it can make up, you know, maximum, I think about 112,000 a year. Um, and that housing would still be considered affordable. Uh, we also heard questions and a desire for more retail around how many units would be prioritized for those at risk of being displaced from the neighborhood. So the future public review draft that will come out in a few weeks um, will address what we heard by including details um, like the affordable units will remain affordable for 99 years, the number of affordable homes should be a good percentage of the total homes on site, uh, exceeding current housing requirements. Um, you know, requiring at least 25% of all new affordable units created to be prioritized for households at risk of displacement from surrounding neighborhoods. Uh, and, you know, a recommendation around adding funding as needed to support down payment assistance, rental assistance, property tax assistance, foreclosure prevention, and similar programs for impacted residents. Oops. Um, in terms of the economic recommendations, these are recommendations around small businesses. Um, this affirms basically the recommendations already um, that we had uh, around supporting local businesses and businesses owned by people of color. Some comments received expressed some skepticism about the ability to recruit a grocer. And um, you know, the feedback generally reflects what will be in the public review draft. In terms of design quality recommendations, uh, there is mixed support for uh, there is support. Sorry, there is support for mixed use neighborhood Main Street co as a concept, uh, as well as support for the strategy that calls for local artists creating art that reflects the neighborhood and the history of the neighborhood. At the open house and during the site walks, we heard comments around views to the west um, and from the open house feedback and from our community navigator input and feedback. There was a desire expressed for natural materials like brick to be used that are compatible uh, with and harmonized with the existing buildings that you see around the neighborhood. Um, so in response, uh, the public review draft of the plan will include additional language adding recommendations to reduce the visual scale of those taller buildings uh, to open up views and preserve sunlight on public streets and sidewalks. Uh, more specifically, a strategy around using upper story setbacks to break down the scale of those buildings and vary the building height and design large building as a combination of more modest buildings to create a smaller scale rhythm and pattern along the sidewalk edges. Uh, an additional strategy encouraging the use of high quality natural mat materials found uh, throughout Park Hill like brick 
um, will be added. And uh, mobility, so feedback themes. A strong majority of the open house respondents felt that the draft mobility strategies would um, help achieve a safe multimodal mobility framework for the area. Many comments mentioned a need for better pedestrian bike connections to Smith Road. So in response, um, we'll call out a desire for better connection um, via Smith Road shared huge paths, path underneath Colorado Boulevard. Um, interestingly, the Dahlia Street connection, that connection between 39th and 38th, um, was not really mentioned much at the open house in the, all the feedback that we receive um, as a concern among those respondents, the broader community. Oops, yeah, I go backwards. Okay. So um, feedback themes, quality of life infrastructure. We've heard support for the policy of 100 acres of parks and open spaces, and we want to acknowledge um, that we did receive some comments from the community regarding uh, continuing to express the desire for all parks and open spaces. Uh, you know, uh, for this, we want to focus on a mix of uses, uh, including a large park and open space um, that we worked on in 2021 for the prevailing vision. Um, and we had questions regarding the integration of the 25 acres of detention and ensuring that the city does not have to pay for the parkland. Uh, we've heard high support for a variety of recreational opportunities for future park space. Many responses stress the importance of inclusion of natural areas in landscaping. Comments around inclusion of future facilities in parking. So additionally, we've heard continued support for plan policies related to the urban tree canopy. Uh, the feedback that we collected suggests the importance of selecting climate appropriate tree species and avoidance of a monoculture of tree species on uh, public and private land, uh, areas. Uh, questions around how we ensure a robust tree canopy in parks and privately owned spaces also was a frequent topic that we heard in those feedback themes. Uh, general support for the policy, um, uh, Future Park having frontage along Colorado Boulevard, but um, comments around ensuring that portion adjacent to Colorado Boulevard is uh, a desirable and enjoyable design experience. So making sure that there's a uh, good design and that it's um, a usable space. Um, the public review draft has strength, strength Oops, strengthen recommendations with language around making sure climate appropriate tree species are planted both on public and private property. Additionally, all the input provided will be taken into account and carried over for a future parks master plan um, when the time is appropriate. So feedback and response for the land use and built form recommendations. Uh, feedback was supportive of allowing a greater mix of uses in more places where development uh, was envisioned. So to be clear, not on the 100 acres of parks and open spaces. How that translates over to responding to community feedback would be in the plan uh, on those contexts and places map. There would be um, uh, additional area as urban center and community center designations uh, rather than that residential high medium areas. Again, not on the area, 100 acres of parks and open spaces, just to be clear. Uh, in terms of building height, uh, feedback uh, varied on where to allow more building height. In the areas where the choice was between eight and 12 stories, uh, we'll limit to eight stories in height. And in the area, the choice uh, was between five and eight stories, we'll allow for up to eight stories in height. Building height recommendations should be reviewed in tandem with the design quality recommendations to understand the direction uh, on the upper story setbacks for the tallest buildings and the open space map to understand that there will be greenways and green corridors allowing and opening up views uh, to the west. So what's next? Uh, currently, we're still reviewing um, all that community input that we received to uh, strengthen these draft plan recommendations. We anticipate a public review draft of the plan will be available um, and the, uh, to be review and comment on uh, via the project webpage in a few weeks. At that time, uh, we'll also have all the community comments to date posted there too. So any comments that are received via you know, the online comment form, um, other 
comments, we will post those all at the same time in one batch. Um, so that is the end of what I have, if we want to discuss that. Any, any thoughts or feedback or any, just any additional things that steering committee members want to add based on what you've seen or heard or just any responses? Uh, your mom. Hold on, grab the microphone for us. My response is that from the very beginning, I've been, I've had a concern about equity and uh, 100 acres of open space, it's not equitable, you know, in, in terms of what the community needs. So that's a, that's a major concern uh, for me. Patty? And then yeah, I feel like for me, it seems like with what the community, whoever was there that day, and I'm sorry, I wasn't able to come. It seems like everything, the feedback that you guys received was everything that the city wanted to do with this project. So it seems kind of, you know, I mean, I'm sure, I'm sure it's all legitimate, but I just don't think that some of the community members have more time to think of the discussions we've been talking about. So I just kind of want to be transparent to when you present this, is this a community feedback from one session you have with community members, which is June 30th, versus the conversations we've had, that had and discussed within the past two years that we've been talking about this. So I just want to, I just want to be transparent with the public of what the community had the chance to talk to. It was only one day and with a other discussions before and prior to that. And, and I'm not sure if they were just shown this and they were like sold into something that they will like versus other options that they might have. I don't know that they think that they have any other options in my opinion. So what we just shown is a um, not just from the open house, but it's taking that into account. So like we said from, and I can go back maybe to the first slide to kind of inform, rewind. So we've had a lot of different ways that we've heard from the community throughout the process and how we've taken community input into account in forming these draft recommendations and what we've heard and how we've revised. Now, you know, the, the open house is just one kind of point of, feedback and input. We've had lots of community steering committee meetings where we listen to all the input that you guys give us. We take notes, we take that in, we take, you know, we've had two rounds of community navigator feedback. Uh, all of these kind of data points in totality, those are all taken together. I guess my point is that you take what you wanna hear and you put it in here, but what you don't wanna hear, you don't put in here. Does that make sense? Yeah, you know, I think we all know that there's a lot of different opinions on, um, you know, various opinions about things for the Park Hill Golf Course. Um, but we look for themes generally. If we're seeing trends and themes, that's kind of how we're looking through things. So, Courtney, maybe I can follow up on Patty. Do you have the raw data of the number of comments received? Like the volume? Yeah, we'll post those. Sorry, you can hear me. So you can hear me at home. Um, we do have the, the raw data, and that will be posted at the same time um, with the uh, public review draft. It will all be made available online. Is that completely transparent? All the comments? All of them. We can sift through. 100%. Yes. Do you, do you have any idea in your head how many there were? A lot. <laughs> yeah, and I, I think I'm, I'm gonna echo Patty and I'm sorry to interrupt, but it was on her train. I'm curious what earns a bullet point, and what earns a bold, like the term, um, sorry, my phone went quiet here, but the term climate appropriate tree species seems very specific to have that be a lot of community feedback. So I'm curious, like, did you amalgamate like a 
appropriate trees to come up with that term. And on the flip side, it's very interesting that you pointed out that there was infrequent comments on the Dahlia Street connection. It just, that definitely is a red flag to me of what is infrequent. You know, how many, how many comments leads to a bullet point, leads to a bold, leads to, well, that is infrequent. And that's my piece. Thank you. I agree with that. I think that was very, I don't know, maybe weird in my way, the way you guys provided that information to us. Dr. Ross, I think you're on mute. I look like you mouth and called on me. Sorry about that, Roger. Yes, I was calling on you. Yeah, um, I just like to uh, revisit um, Imam sentiment in terms of uh, 100 acres is what we're here now. We started off at 55. And in terms of equity, we're talking about 155 acres. And if 100 acres is going to be open space, that says to me, the math says that there's 55 acres for any other type of development. And I'm just wondering really what that looks like, because it seems like we're putting way too much into a small space. And in terms of equity, um, 100 100 acres of 155 is not equity. And I just you know, wanted to voice that. I just, it doesn't seem right. Thank you, Mohammed. Thank you, um, several comments here. So Courtney, you said the data will be available. Will it be broken down like this portion of, I mean, it will be anonymized, but this many people came to workshop one, this many people came to workshop two. No, it's just a, it's the raw data. It's in a spreadsheet. It's okay. like all the comments. My concern there is that the two rounds of community navigator are essentially the same people. So if they said the same thing twice, it's gonna be counted twice versus trying to count for individual, unique individuals versus the sessions. So um, let's move on to the next one where you had the um, draft recommendations on the slide where you had like this much percentage AMI and all the other stuff there. A couple of questions on that slide. Uh, the next one, um, I think the, the, the- Which one, I'm sorry, I didn't- the, the one after, the housing one, sorry. So, um, it requires at least 25% of all new affordable units create, to be created prioritized for household at risk of displacement from surrounding neighborhoods. What's the criteria there for at risk? And the second is where is the funding coming from the down payment assistance and other programs? Hi, uh, my name is Brad Weinig. I'm with the Department of Housing Stability, or host with the city. And um, to answer your first question, Mohammed, the um, definition of at risk from displacement um, is really based on a, a policy currently in development in our department called the prioritization policy. And, it, and it's kind of based on a bunch of research and analysis about who's vulnerable and, and why. And, and so kind of the longer you've lived in the neighborhood, you kind of have, you know, more waiting. You've got larger family size. If you have disabilities in your household, if you've got a large number of kids in your house, or dependent on local schools. I mean, so trying to kind of identify folks who really have the most to lose if they can no longer afford to remain in the neighborhood as best as we can, kind of using using data. But um, that that policy proposal is currently out um, <clears throat> for for review on our on our unhost website, and so I encourage everyone to take a look at at, at what's in there. I'm um, gonna, in, in, in talking about that, Mohammed, I forgot your second question. Um, what about people who have already been displaced? Is there any plan of bringing them back together in that policy? Y yes, they're, they're also um, designed to have benefited from that prioritization policy, which just basically means that they get elevated um, on, a, on a database and wait list that's in the process of being developed to ensure that they have kind of every opportunity to access new income restricted affordable rental and for sale units as part of this development and, and again this is a citywide policy but this is one where it's clearly come up as important in this neighborhood um, it's important for for us as a city to to focus on neighborhoods like this and we see this as a as a really impactful opportunity to, should anything be developed here that we've got a great opportunity to kind of prove out that a model like this a policy like this can can work and be effective the question was uh, where is that funding coming from? the funding for down payment, rental, other assistances? 
Yeah, and so in theory, we, we already have you know some funding to, to to focus on those citywide programs. But if they can be leveraged, flexed, increased, um, complemented with private funds from West Side or other community investment groups around the neighborhood as part of this, we want to make sure that that's um, that, that we're able to make that happen. It could be that the funding flows through the city. It could be that it flows through a local you know nonprofit and becomes part of that kind of community benefits agreement. But that was again a theme that that we had heard through a lot of folks were needing support on their current payments, on their on their tax payments, on their mortgage payments, um, on their rent in the neighborhood. And it's kind of a strategy to, a, at least on a temporary basis, keep them in the neighborhood while additional housing options are being created. Any other, any other, uh, Lamone? Yeah, that's a second. How you doing? Good, good to see you. Good. Yeah, we can see you. So I just got some questions about numbers. Um, looking at the layout for the um, residential and business development on 40% of the land, uh, what are the total number of homes? And of that number, the total number of affordables, market rate, are there any detached housing and what is a percentage of space allotted for retail development, okay? And then is there any information about the other developments around 40th and Colorado uh, that are involved with housing? How many units are going up in those developments? So Lamone, I think um, Kenneth might be the, Kenneth or Brad might be the most uh, appropriate to answer your first part of the question. Hey, Lamone. Hey, um, how are you? Good. So, you know, one of these things uh, where we're at in the process is um, recommendations around all this. And, and I think that some of that's related to the uh, densities and the, you know, um, the places map. Is that what you guys call it? Um, and so, I think what we're showing there are um, densities of four, uh, five, eight, and up to four, five, eight, and 12 um, stories. And so um, the total number of homes is gonna be somewhat determined by the rezoning. And we're... We're working through that um, now and I think that the percentage of affordable is something that um, we anticipate being part of both the development agreement and the community benefits agreement. Um, so I know that, uh, you know, my initial uh, conversations with CBA haven't gotten into that level of detail yet, but I look forward to having that discussion. In terms of um, detached housing, are you saying like single family housing? Is that what you're asking about? Yeah, where you have a um, front and a back door. Right. Well, I think that there will be units with a front and a back door that uh, don't necessarily have to be detached housing. There are a number of different forms um, that will uh, that could that could do that. Um, but I think that given the um, given the importance of uh, open space here, I think the you know the trade off that has been discussed is talking about. Um, more attached product um, and multifamily product rather than uh, single family homes. Uh, single family homes, unfortunately, are um, not only unsustainable, but also um, unaffordable right now. And when we look at single family homes being uh, on average over $800,000, I think we're trying to um, hit a, a better price point, um, both on the for rent and for sale side of that. And then in terms of the other development surrounding, do you guys have that data? I know that ULC is in a rezoning, but I don't know the details here. Uh, this is Brad Winding with the Housing Stability Department, our host again. Um, and let me to answer your um, question or to, to, to buy time to answer your question, we are in the process of working with um, the, the um, analyst group led by um, Arland Economic Group to kind of 
update and paint a picture of the surrounding um, numbers of units, um, both restricted and unrestricted in, in kind of the area. And so that's, that is um, in develop in development as we, as we speak, and hopefully it would be available um, in the not distant future, although I'm not 100% sure on timing of that. So the number of homes is, is still up in the air based upon the um, number of stories um, for the housing, is that correct? Yes, as well as um, just, you know, what I, what I know I've heard, and I don't, I don't know that I've, I've seen it in this feedback, but I've seen that there's a variety of, um, or desire for uh, larger family size units on the affordable side as well. And so as you look at, you know, larger units, unit count comes down typically associated with that. Um, you know, it, it will always be a range rather than a precise number, I think, um, when you're talking about these sorts of things. But the policy goal will be to satisfy not only a range of incomes, um, I think also a range of ages and a range of uh, for sale and for rent. We're hearing that loud and clear. Um, and frankly, you know, we're, we're looking forward to having that discussion about, um, you know, what exactly, what numbers exactly we want to have. Um, in this community. And these are either apartments or townhomes, is that correct? Uh, they will either be probably apartments, townhomes, possibly um, stacked duplexes. Um, okay. I think that we're, you know, looking at a lot of different forms and, you know, that's the uniqueness of this opportunity here to really um, think more creatively. There are, I think, based on what I know of the city, there are fewer than 2,000 uh, for sale income restricted homes in the entire city. And so we're really uh, excited to be able to make uh, a big difference in terms of the amount of uh, for sale uh, of, uh, below market or missing middle homes um, here and thinking about creative strategies to do that. So as well as implementing, implementing this prioritization policy, to not only uh, prevent displacement, but actually bring people back into this community. We think that's a really important um, thing that we've heard over the, you know, three years that we've been talking to people, certainly. Okay, that's all I had. Thank you. Yeah, uh, I know we're talking like high level about the units and we don't have clear answers. Um, aside from the CBA that we've talked about, what are the assurances that we will have that say like, the numbers that we identify in terms of affordable units and all of these things will follow through because my understanding is that Westside is not a builder, right? So they will parcel out land and sell it to builders and they will do what they want. So um, more information on that would be great. Brad Wining with Housing Stability or host again. Um, good question. So we will uh, th these kinds of commitments will be codified in a, an eventual development agreement that we've been discussing that development agreement will be recorded and run um, with the land which means that both west side and any subsequent owners of the property are obligated to fulfill the obligations of that agreement um, the expectation is that west side would work with any buyers of, of property within this development should it happen right to to ensure that you know that to pass that um, memorandum of understanding obligation on and then at the end of the development process when the home the condo development the townhomes the apartments are created um, 99 year covenants will get recorded against those those properties to, again to ensure long-term affordability and then that kind of rolls up into our my department's compliance um, apartment asset management and compliance team who oversees our portfolio of affordable housing investments ranging from those that we put money into all the way up to kind of these market rate negotiated um, agreements that we have across the city. Do we have any other questions virtually? Uh, Roger? Yeah, I have just one more question for Brad. You know, um, fast forwarding, if you will, understanding that uh, due to 301, the passage of 301, that the entire city will vote uh, I guess, an acceptance development. Could you share a little bit about what that looks like? Because I read something that talked about it would not more than likely make the November ballot. And so moving forward, what does that look like in the future?
So let me just make sure I'm understanding the question. Um, you want to know what the what it will look like the the vote, the citywide vote on the conservation easement? Sure, sure. That, that's a good start. Sure. Okay. Um, well, if this plan is um, approved by city council, um, it would go to at some time in the future be forwarded um, onto a vote of the people. And that would be the question on the ballot would be if full or partial release of the conservation easement that's on the property. Currently, um, the conservation easement remains in place and will continue to do so unless um, there's a vote of the people. Oh. Okay. Right. I think I think yeah. David wants to talk to you. Yeah, just to add a little little extra Make to sure that. I think is so they know. is the process right of how right. we get there in the sense that so we're working on the area plan right now, and we talked in the last presentation, and there's a slide here today about the package that would go in front of city council, right? So before they would decide to to consider putting that language on the ballot, they would have um, a an adopted area plan. Uh, potentially the rezoning, the development agreement that Brad was just speaking of. And I would imagine they'd be aware of the uh, the CBA that uh, James Roy and his team is working on. So the city council would have all that in front of them before they would decide if they want to refer that ballot um, to a vote of the people. All right, thank you for that. Lamone, all right, do you have a question or is your hand still up from your previous question? Okay, let's go to Patty and we'll come back to Lamone if you have a question. Patty? Yes, I, I just had a question of like, if is this plan gonna be represented as the plan that the city put together for the council to see? I mean, it seems like to me that you guys are really putting this together for them or is it gonna say, oh, after talking to the committee, we all agree in this plan, this is what's presented and just, I'm just kind of wondering how is it going to be presented because I think I don't know that we all in this committee agree with all of this in this plan. So I'm just want to make sure that the that that they know that and they know the reasons why behind it. If there's an opportunity for us to maybe talk to them about it before they approve it. So I pulled up the, the area plan process timeline on this slide, and you know, this is the draft plan. It'll go before planning board, um, and we will characterize essentially the, the input that we've received from all different uh, avenues, like we've explained. Um, there'll be an opportunity for steering committee members if you would like to come and, and testify. Ideally, with these processes, we like to get uh, consensus or near consensus, um, especially from the steering committee on supporting the, the plan. Um, we're planning on also having a listening session after the, the draft plan is released from the steering committee to you know, hear what you guys have to say and garner support for uh, the plan document. Um, but ultimately, yes, we will, you know, there's opportunities for steering committee members to um, testify at both planning board and before city council. Great. I think that will be very beneficial for all of us and for them to understand, in my opinion. Echoing Patty, this is Sean. Who is the ultimate author of the plan? Sean, I, I can take that. David Gasper, principal city planner with CPD. I, I think this is a really important uh, conversation to kind of understand the, the role of planners in this room, right? I mean, uh, I know sometimes we like to you know, talk planner ease, right? But I mean, that's what Courtney and, and my job really comes down to is designing a process such as this that tries to hear from as many voices as possible and then um, bringing that together into some sort of plan document that captures it. It's not really consensus, right? We're never going to get to 100% on this, especially when we have such a diverse um, uh, opinions on a lot of topics. 
but we're trying to find a, a middle ground, right? And where we are going to hear probably um, some dissent on both sides of a topic means we're probably hitting something right in the middle, right? And we're trying to find something that we can can get around and say, you know, I mean, this is, um, you know, what is the vision for the community overall, right? It may not 100% align with my opinion or her opinion, but as, as a whole, it it. it is the community's vision, right? And so, um, you know, we would move a, a plan through planning board, city council, they ask a lot of tough questions on how a plan gets uh, developed. And I will ask questions just like you are to, here today. And, um, you know, ultimately it's the decider of planning board and city council, if we did a good enough job to, to have a plan that they feel is representative of the community. Um, and that's, that's where they would decide to adopt the plan or not. I have two comments or questions, I guess. I, I'm Rachel Coates, sorry. Um, I noticed the August 4th community information meeting is also the night of Greater Park Hill community meeting. Um, so I imagine for a lot of people in this room and other people who participate, that may be a, a conflict. Um, so I just wanted to name that. Um, I also... I've brought it up before and I guess I haven't heard a super clear answer, but um, I imagine because there's no infrastructure on the land existing in terms of roads, sewers, electricity, all that good stuff, um, that's gonna need to be funded. Um, is it expected or do we know if a Metro tax district will be in place for this land to, to pay for the infrastructure? Kenneth O with uh, Westside. Um, so we do anticipate that um, a metropolitan district, which is basically, for those of you who don't know, it's a, a funding mechanism that basically um, in, adds uh, property tax uh, mills to um, certain properties within the development itself. So there will be no added property tax mills beyond the borders of um, the Park Hill Golf Course. Um, that basically, just like you have a mortgage for your house, um, it creates a mortgage for the infrastructure. It's a mechanism to pay for the infrastructure over time, which actually decreases affordability or, or increases affordability, um, decreases the immediate cost um, for uh, those improvements. Um, one of the things that we have uh, already thought about and, and are planning to commit to is that no, um, of no housing that is uh, income restricted to households making 80% or less of AMI will be subject to the um, bond mill levies associated with those improvements. So we understand, you know, because that's basically robbing Peter to pay Paul, right, in terms of the income levels and the amount that you have to pay or that you're able to pay is fixed. And the, the amounts that are uh, subject to um, that household cost are your rent your utilities, as well as your property taxes. I'm sorry. Does that then mean that the people making more than 80% AMA will be paying that much more? Because my understanding in historical context of the Metro Tax District, those prices go up over years and people end up getting priced out. No, that, that's not accurate. So um, the way that MET districts work is there's a cap on the mills, um, regardless of, of uh, time period. And so that won't change over time. The amount of mills that will be charged will be consistent over time. All right, coming back um, to our virtual room, do we have any other comments or questions from community members as I'm... Uh, Lamone. Okay, I heard you mention earlier about um, hearings and public comment with the um, different boards and city council. Um, from my experience with public testimony with city council before, they didn't really seem to be moved by sentimental value of the community members that are affected. So what is it that they are really looking for? Is it the hard facts and figures or what are they really looking for so we can prepare?
Yeah, I mean, as staff, we just try to present um, the plan as we feel like the, the community, you know, gave it to us, right? Um, but I don't have any insight on how city council or planning board would react to any particular recommendations or policies um, to your point about about how they will perceive this plan, I, I don't know. Well, that's more about what do they expect from public comment on plans like this. Lamone, and I, I don't, see we have some city council people on the call. Right, so Lamone, I don't know that address. someone can um, answer the question here, but I do think that Councilwoman Candice Abaca, Councilman Chris Herndon, and Councilwoman Robin Kanitra on, and I know that the three of them have been watching this process. So I would suggest maybe emailing that question to one of them, or if you'd like, you can email that question to me on behalf of the steering committee, and I will forward that question uh, to city council members um, from the from the steering committee, and then they can just answer to the, the committee. Um, so just if you decide to do it, share the information. If you want me to do it, shoot me an email, and I'll do it on behalf of the steering committee. Cool. Thank you. Uh-huh. All right. Um, seeing no other questions virtually, do we have any other questions or comments in the room? Okay. Is there, sorry, this is Patty. Is there a way that you guys send us the calendar invite for when this city council is meeting and when you're presenting this so they can hear our opinions or testify? Yeah, once. So you're asking for us to send you like an Outlook calendar invite once the city council meeting has scheduled. So you have that on your calendar. I yes, I think that will be kind of like this meeting that is important for all of us to attend, in my opinion. Sure. If you would like those, I can if, and if the rest of the steering committee would like those. I could once it gets scheduled, I can send it out. Right. Planning board, too. And um, Ludi, there's not really an opportunity for comment. So the Land Use Transportation and Infrastructure Committee of City Council, their role is to just forward that on um, basically saying it's ready for prime time <laughs> at City Council. Um, I won't send you that meeting invite since it's not really an avenue for, for comment, but the uh, once the planning board hearing gets scheduled and the City Council um, I don't know if you guys want first reading or just the actual hearing, but I'll send both. That would be yep. great, Courtney. The draft when it's out, would you like a, a calendar invite to look at the draft? Because it's open for, okay. So once that you can see right here, the draft plan is released, that will be released online. It'll be on the project web page. And um, you'll have the opportunity to review the draft and make comments on the draft. Um, then we can come back on August 23rd and uh, we'll have a listening session. It'll be a work session where you guys can tell us your comments. We won't, we won't have a presentation. We can listen. <laughs> Well, it'll be a Zoom meeting, so you'll get the automatic Zoom. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It won't. Yeah, and that'll be a virtual that will not be in person. That listening section session, but that's all in the wrap up. <laughs> I'll go over that again. Okay, um, Mohammed, did you have a question? And Lamone, I seen your hand up, but I don't know if that was. From your previous question, you took it down, or if you still had a question that was answered? I forgot to take it down. Okay, awesome. Yes, Imam. Didn't get an answer uh, from the city concerning how we got to 100 acres of open space from where we were uh, the last meeting where we were talking about 75 acres. How did we go up like that? David Gasper, CPD. So the 75 acres is the regional park. 
so I think we have a plan recommendation as we discussed in the last meeting, as well as in the workshop of 70, 80 acres of regional park. The 100 acres we're speaking to includes the regional detention. And so it's 100 acres or more total over the entire site. So that's been consistent um, for the last few months, at least. All right, thank you. Um, going back to our virtual room real quick to check and see if there are any more comments or questions. Seeing none there and seeing none here in the room, it looks like mine's, oh, Sean. All right, one second, Sean. This is Sean Smith. I just would love it if that August 23rd meeting could be a hybrid so that we can have a more dynamic discussion than people trading Zoom hands. And I think we're going to lose a lot of what this essence of this committee is if we're all unable to get back to in person. Noted, and we'll follow up on that. One last. Imam. This is concerning uh, businesses. Uh, that's going to be involved, and uh, how uh, are we going to address the the businesses that are going to be coming uh, to the Parkio uh, Golf Course plan? What businesses? Are you saying anyone who's interested in having a business? Um, Ken, you want do you? Have any thoughts on that or? Okay. okay. Yeah. So um, we have Kelsey Clark um, virtually with us today from uh, Dito Business. Kelsey, are you there? Are you able to hear us? She has her hand raised. Let's see here. I'll promote her to a panelist. Kelsey, you should be able to unmute yourself. Hi, can you guys hear me? This is Kelsey Clark from Ness Sostito. I am here. Can you guys hear me? Mm -hmm. yes. Yep. Great. Um, Iman, do you, do you mind to repeat the question for me, please? Yes, I was uh, expressing uh, those who have uh, business concerns who want to be involved and get their businesses uh, inside the um, the golf course? Yeah, that's thank you for bringing that up. That's a great question, um, James Roy. I'm not sure if you're still in the room, but um, it was really exciting to hear through the community benefits agreement process um, that there is active recruitment for um, to get representation for existing. Um, local businesses in the community. So um, I think that's going to be a great opportunity to provide additional feedback um, directly from businesses that are going to be most impacted um, by these policies. So wanted to share that. And so just excited for, for more of those conversations and more feedback. Um, currently, as it relates to the area plan, um, you can see here, um, there are kind of three main um, recommendations that have been um, presented um, from uh, small businesses via the, the 2019 um, visioning um, engagement process. And so, um, so there's a couple of things that specifically address. One of them is going to be on really creating kind of affordable space for local businesses. Um, so you can kind of see here in some of these um, recommendations, there's a variety of different um, recommendations. One of them is going to be around kind of rent reduction um, and then some subsidies to support um, businesses to really create that space um, for existing um, businesses um, that are in the area. Um, there are also, um, there was a, a variety of recommendations from small businesses on the interest of creating um, community like um, business incubator spaces 
um, to really help foster opportunities from like a te technical assistance perspective, um, from little things around like, how do I make sure that, um, you know, I am qualified via the Secretary of State um, to better understanding permitting, um, um, to also really um, acknowledging the importance of, of legal, legal support and assistance. Um, and not only for those that are newly businesses um, and that are startup businesses, but also for businesses um, that have been um, established for quite some time. Um, so those are just a few of, of the recommendations and um, definitely happy to, to talk in much more detail offline or to answer anything specific around what I just shared with you. Thank you, Kelsey. Uh, we will go to Shanta and then we're going to begin the transition to public comment. Hi, uh, so I, I'm, I'm just curious, have there already been discussions with potential businesses? Um, and if so, when is that information going to be revealed? Um, because I know that there were some rumblings about that, you know, and that's, that's one of the uh, reasons that the CBA process needs to be transparent, because, you know, that's something that the community should know about, um, but particularly this committee. Um, so can anybody speak to that? It looks looks like James Roy is gone, but I think that's a question we can forward to him. I don't know if Kelsey has an answer, but it sounds like the CBA committee is in the process of recruiting um, local businesses, and so we can I can follow up and see if we can get you an answer for that. Uh, Kelsey, do you have anything else to add there? Yeah, Shanta, that's a great question, and. Um... And I agree, um, kind of around that transparency. I don't have an answer around that. Um, I am connecting with James. And so uh, Dr. Ross, um, James, you and I can definitely kind of reconnect on that to make sure that um, we share a, a more specific update on small business engagement to the steering committee. Thank you. And I would just say, you know, for those small and local businesses, typically they don't have business plans that go out two, three, four years. And, you know, depending on what happens in this process, it's pretty far um, down the road that there will actually be anything built here. Um, and obviously subject to a lot of different process. So I think, um, you know, that said, every Thursday, we have a food truck, uh, a Colorado Boulevard food truck hub where a lot of small businesses come already. Um, and we certainly are familiar with a lot of the small businesses operating um, in the neighborhood. And we've already had many conversations with them, um, whether they're barbershops, whether they're uh, food uh, restaurants, or even um, small uh, retailers, who we've started to um, already have uh, interactions with because it's just part of the community. So, um, but again, that's more of a long term kind of a um, strategy around that once we actually have a plan in place and voter approval. Thank you. And it looks like Lamone, I see your hand. Is that okay? Yeah, I'm back in the game. So in terms of uh, business development, the standard appears to be um, business and housing go hand in hand. It doesn't make sense to put up a um, housing development in this case in Northeast Park Hill, and then the residents need to run across Colfax or into Aurora to buy groceries. It doesn't make sense. So if you look at Stapleton, that's a very successful model of how business and housing mix as well. You have uh, an, uh, a built-in customer base, plus the surrounding community supports the businesses. So I think it's a good plan. That's all I got. Thank you. Um, just want to say thank you to everyone for your for your comments. As always, if you're a processor and something comes up a little bit later, feel free to email that to myself or Courtney, and we'll make sure that that question gets routed to the appropriate person and we get you an answer. Uh, at this time, we're going to switch over to our public comment session. Um, it looks like we have eight individuals who are signed up for comment tonight. As you know, 
Um, the comments are designed for community to talk to the steering committee. Each comment is uh, two minutes. And uh, to our commenters, we'll ask that you remember that our steering committee members are community members too, and we want to be respectful um, of them and their time and commitment. And um, and we want to to keep our comments respectful. And so, with that being said, we're going to start our session. And the first person I have is Basil. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you, Basil. You have two minutes. All right, thank you. So yeah, my name is uh, Basil Sabah. I'm a resident of Park Hill. I'm also a business owner in North Park Hill. Um, probably over the years, I've hired hundreds of employees. Um, you know, and we're based in uh, north of I-70. Um, I'm kind of tuning into this now, but um, I really kind of have two points. Um, the first one is in regards to the kind of the material the city's putting out about um, kind of the survey that 70% of um, people, at least in the neighborhood or Denver, um, support development. Um, I, I personally think it just that just seems completely false. It's a false narrative. Um, I mean, from the vote, from what I can see on the 301, 302, um, only about 2% of the precincts in Denver supported development. Um, so I just feel it's highly unethical the city's promoting that somehow this is supported by the voters of Denver. And I think even looking, it's hard to tell by the numbers, but even looking at North Park Hill, it seems like the, uh, the support is a lot closer to 30%, even close to the park. Um, and the second point, as a business guy, I keep looking at the, um, that I've asked the city several times about the conservation easement, and I sort of keep getting the same answer, which is this has sort of been tabled and, you know, we're going to discuss it at some other time. But it seems to be, um, it, it's a big issue because there's a value to that conservation easement. My estimate is the value of that easement is probably $100 million dollars. And the fact the city's chosen to completely ignore an asset worth 100 million is, is feels extremely irresponsible. Um, I mean, I, I don't think the city should keep lobbying the public to walk away from an asset worth probably close to 100 million dollars. And I just want to point that out to the city. Instead, they should really kind of um, flex their leverage to get well, the. You reached your time. Thank you so much. Next up, we have Alex Walsh. Hold up my notes. All right, thank you. I'm here to urge this committee to, or I'm here to ask this committee to urge CPD to have Westside move the required community information meeting for the large area development plan due to Westside's failure to meet the minimum procedural requirements for notice to the public. My household was notified by mail 18 days prior to the upcoming meeting where the requirement is at least 21 days. The notice sent by Westside includes intentionally misleading information including that 25 acres of stormwater detention area as part of their 100 acres of parks. Um, this was just confirmed that that is not part of the 100 acres of parks um, by members of CPD. The signage requirements for the notice uh, posted on the property state the notice must be legible for neighbors and passers-by. However, on the 35th side, the notice is posted on the opposite side of the chain link fence, obscuring the information and in an area of the property that has no sidewalk, making the notice impossible to read. Lastly, the meeting conflicts with another event in the community and may create a scheduling conflict for members of city council. Greater Park Hill Coalition meeting is already scheduled for that same night. Many members of Westside Investment Properties and their contract with public relations team usually attend those meetings, so it's perplexing why such a night was chosen. This goes against the recommendations as published by CPD in the Community Information Meeting Guide for Permit Applicants. Simply, they failed to meet the requirements and, and should follow the process as outlined in the city's documentation in order to proceed. Please use your platform to have CPD enforce its own rules and move the meeting to a time when the process can be completed appropriately. Thanks. Thank you. 
Next up, we have Brother Jeff Fard. All right. Can you we, hear me? We got you loud and clear, Brother Jeff. You have two minutes. Okay, thank, thank you so much. Um, it's, it's amazing to see another swipe of the cat's paw. And it's interesting listening to this meeting because it seems like an insider meeting uh, with good intentions. I'm telling you that I would think that I'm listening to a city park golf course meeting as opposed to a Park Hill golf course meeting. And the difference is one is public, the other is private and we didn't have this much engagement with the public golf course. I wanna say that I listened to Patty, um, I think it was Patty Sands, and she said, optimistically, she believes that, you know, there is sincerity in this process and it's legitimate. Uh, Patty, I'll assure you that it is illegitimate and it's just another opportunity to thwart the will and the desire of the individuals who voted to have a conservation easement. West Side developers and others know that the clock is tipping, that is ticking. Their investment is, is, is losing ground every moment they don't have something happening economically on that land. And you have an administration that has been favorable to it, to developers constantly thwarting the, the will of the people and putting together what I consider an Amway meeting. If you remember Amway, they always began their meeting with what type of house would you like to live in? You never got the house, but you ended up buying a box of soap. So I would just say for all the voters that are going to be listening to this, watch this process. It's an example of this city's administration and to you city council members that are also listening and watching in on this, this is going to be a referendum on how you'll run a new city. And hopefully it won't be a mile high income city, but a city where we all can at least participate on equal footing. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, next up we have Kevin Wiegland. Oh. Or Weekend, I'm sorry. Weekend, sorry. Right on. Thank you, Kevin. You have two minutes. Um, first, uh, thanks for letting me uh, speak. Uh, I just want to say, Basil, Alex, and Brother Jeff, love everything you said. Um, my name is Kevin Weegan. Um, I'm a board member of the Greater Park Hill RNO. I was a founding board member of Prodigy Non-for-Profit Coffee Shop just a block away from the northeast corner, northwest corner of the golf course. I sat on the Clayton Community Board and studied the future of the golf course with David Martin and Kevin Doyle. Um, I'm a licensed architect. I specialize in multifamily housing and affordable multifamily housing. Um, earlier time in my career, I was a real estate developer. I have been involved in this process for five years, going on five years now. With my community background and my professional experience, I think I'm pretty qualified to speak on this. Our former mayor, Wellington Webb, and the city council and the people decided wisely to invest $2 million of our tax dollars to keep the 155 acres open space. Conservation eas easement was placed on this property to ensure the land would never be developed to benefit the citizens of Denver. Denver. Jump ahead a quarter century. Now they're going full force to get this conversation easement removed and develop the land. Why are they doing this? The simple, month, simple answer is it's money. The they are West Side Development and the elected officials of the city of Denver. West Side wants to develop this land because it will make them a huge profit. And that's what developers do. That doesn't necessarily make them evil. The fact that the city, the, that the mayor and many members of the city council do everything they can to make this happen is because they, they see the responsibility to the developers over the responsibility to the citizens of Denver. Last November, the citizens voted and made it clear that they want the 155 acres to remain open space. But the mayor and the planning department have ignored this and keep pushing their removal of the conservation easement because that is what West Side has directed them to do. The people of Denver own the right to keep this, undeveloped, uh, this property undeveloped. If the I'm city so sorry, sir, you've reached your time. Next up, we have Jackie Lansing. Hello, I have some prepared remarks. 
I disagree with what the committee calls the prevailing vision for the 155 acre parcel of land. George W. Clayton's vision for the land in 1899 was for it to remain agricultural, i.e. open as grassland, forest, or other undeveloped use. In 1997, Wellington Webb and the uh, citizens of Denver added a layer of protection to further Clayton's wish by purchasing the development rights to the land. For the deed to the property, the right to develop is extinguished forever. Yet in co contravention of this legal constraint, prevailing scientific arguments, Denver's own planning documents related to parks, climate and sustainability, tree canopy cover, outside develop and outside documents prepared by the Trust for Public Land, the park people, Earth Justice, and even Denver's commitment to maintain this parcel of land as open space as grantee of the conservation easement, the city persists in seeking to further the owner's, owner developer's agenda. Denver consists of approximately 100,000 acres of land with less than 9% parkland compared to other major cities. Denver sorely lacks adequate parkland. New York City has 27%, Rome has 34%, Madrid 35%, Moscow 54%, etc. Um, locating buildings on open space that contain um, open space that combats pollution, reduces heat, adds oxygen, makes no sense when other previously paved areas for such development exist. Buildings in themselves produce pollution both directly and indirectly. They emit more carbon dioxide, 39%, than transportation, 33%, or industry, 29 The American Lung Association named Denver among the most polluted cities in the country in 2022, with North Denver, arguably one of the most polluted uh, parts of Denver, with Suncor, Cherokee Power Plant, Metro Wastewater. Thank you, Jackie, you've reached your time. Uh, next up, we have Robert Greer. Hi, everybody, my name's Rob. Um, yeah, I continue to be disappointed by a lot of familiar faces and voices uh, in these discussions. There are a lot of misconceptions about what constitutes uh, beneficial environmental measures. Uh, you know, the IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel for Climate Change, for those of you who don't know, shocking number who don't know, um, says that there's really no way to make a city like Denver low carbon without densifying it considerably. Uh, because the more spread out, more sprawled out a city is, uh, the more energy you need to get around the city. Um, it's, it's, it's a major problem. Um, we should, of course, try to have as many trees as possible. Trees are actually most helpful when they're right by buildings. Um, having, you know, an, a, a quote unquote park space that's really too large to be used as a park and too far away from a dense populations of people to be used by many people uh, is not good environmental policy. Um, I would encourage you to talk to actual climate experts about this because it's counterintuitive. And the environmental science that was taught in the 1970s is not the same environmental science that's being taught today. Uh, my day job, I'm an anti-eviction attorney. I see the ravages of Denver's housing crisis on a daily basis. Um, once every couple months, somebody, usually an older person, who uh, was not fortunate enough to buy a house for $20,000 in the 70s, uh, tells me that they plan to kill themselves because there's not enough housing in Denver for them to, uh, to access. Um, so, you know, when privileged, often millionaires in South Park Hill uh, end up dominating these conversations, uh, the public comment sections, uh, because they have the privilege to spend, you know, inordinate amounts of time on these pointless community meetings. Uh, it really distresses me because, Thank you. you know, it means- Thank you, Robert. You reached your time. Uh, next up, we have Ilani Saris. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can. You have two minutes. I wanted to just tell you that um, I've been listening to the meeting this afternoon or this evening, 
And I would challenge you as steering committee members to consider the feedback you've heard, um, consider the lack of transparency. Um, I, as a resident of the city and county of Denver, I'm always distressed when I hear that details can't be released about potential agreements, and yet you want us to trust you on this development, on this piece of property. I hear that we have problems um, or that we want there to be 99 year affordability that's gonna run with the land. Well, so does the conservation easement, which is threatened with being taken away. So all of this is being done at the behest of a developer that bought particular land where there was an existing conservation easement. Um, and no one has talked about, nothing in this presentation talks about retaining the conservation easement. Doesn't talk about keeping the 155 acres as open space or park land as an easement. So it already is predicated upon the idea of development, which means to me as a, as a resident, you've already made your decision. It's a question of which one of the three scenarios is it going to be? Well. The, the voters have overwhelmingly said which of the scenarios that they want, and that is no on the development. And I can tell you as a person who values parkland, and we're rapidly losing that, this is a need for this community, just as urgent as any of the other needs. And this one has a legal conservation on it. So I really ask you to listen to the feedback you're hearing from people like Brother Jeff. And, and, and search why we're even going through this process when Ken Ho slipped. Thank you, you reached your time. Uh, our, next, our next commenter is Helen Bradshaw. Okay. All right, it looks like Helen is not with us. And so with that being said, we will end the public comment uh, session and just wanna say thank you to all the community members who are listening and those who signed up to share their thoughts with the steering committee. And um, we'll transition to just some final thoughts um, and what's happening next. And so, um, as always, this re the recording of this meeting will be available online after the meeting. The Park Hill Golf Course area plan, the public review draft, uh, will be available on the project page in early August. Um, the Park Hill Golf Course Steering Committee, um, virtual, and we'll v visit if it's going to be hybrid work session, will be Tuesday, August 23rd from 5.30 to 7. Right now, it's scheduled to be via Zoom. Um, and this is, there's no formal presentation this evening, no public comment. This is just an opportunity for the steering committee to provide thoughts and feedback on the public review draft. And then our next steering committee meeting will be Tuesday, September 13th from 5.30 to 7.30 um, right here at the golf course. Um, that address is 4141 East 35th Avenue. And at this time, I want to turn it over to Courtney to see if there's anything that I missed um, or if there's any other thing, any anything else from the city. Nope. Okay. <laughs> so we are good there. With that being said, I want to say thank you all for being here. Thank you again for your time and commitment to this process. Uh, it's a pleasure to participate in this with you, and we will see you next time. Thank you, everybody, for being here.